All right, at 6 30 uh, I'm gonna call the study session of the City Council to order. We got uh, three items uh, tonight. Uh, first up is an update on the, the root and renew um, plan and process, then a communications marketing department overview, and then finally uh, economic development financial partnership agreement uh, kind of check-in. So turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Mayor. Good evening members of the council. Um, so for a couple of years now, uh, the council's had as a, a, a priority uh, to update the city's vision and master plan for uh, parks and open space. And we work closely, as you, as you know, with, uh, with South Suburban Parks and Rec on all of our uh, maintaining, operating all of our parks and some of our, our open space and trails. Um, but it's important that the community have our own vision for what our uh, residents are looking for in, in that area. Um, and this process, even this process that we're going to uh, talk about tonight, will, will help us to, to further discussions with South Suburban about, uh, about service levels, future capital plans, and those sorts of things. So I do want to uh, remind the council, uh, before I, I turn this over to our staff and uh, consultants tonight, um, that this project had originally been conceived as a, a visioning and master plan in one project. And we actually went out to bid last summer for this work. And um, for that full product, you, know, you, may, you may recall that we only got one proposal. Um, and it was, we had a hundred, thousand dollars planned in the budget and the bid that we got back was for three hundred fifty thousand dollars so um, at that time we we talked with some of the consultants who we thought would be interested about the project and we kind of thought more about the expertise and the, the, the phasing of the project and this was the, the was this was a resulting plan that we would, would spend this time, this year, um, doing this vision plan that would help us to really understand where, what our, our community is looking for in parks and open space, what you as a counselor are looking for, that again, gives us that platform for discussion of our service agreements with South Suburban, and then sets the stage for further detailed master planning and capital planning for what the community might want in the future. So that's where we are tonight. And uh, the first step in the process was, um, was current conditions of our parks and open space. That's where we're gonna focus tonight. And the team will also talk about next steps in the process, but we wanna bring council in. We've recently engaged the public um, and we wanna make sure that uh, we have your direction along the way as we move forward. So that's what we're about tonight. I wanna turn it over to our uh, Manager of Innovation and Performance Excellence, Adrian Burton, who will uh, lead the uh, presentation and uh, introduce our guest tonight. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your time this evening. Appreciate you having us here tonight. Um, I'm the project manager for Root and Renew. So uh, we started this project back in the fall, and we have Livable City Studio. Um, working on the existing conditions analysis and this vision plan. And we'll be talking more about what that is in, in a moment. Um, our previous master plan, uh, which was a parks, open space, and trails master plan, was completed in 2016. So this is really our opportunity to align this vision with the comprehensive plan. Um, this phase, and we're calling it the visioning phase, is really um, our opportunity to hear from the community about emerging trends and innovation and starting to establish kind of what is the perception from the community of what we're what we're lacking what we want where we want to head um, you know from the standpoint of just looking at the snapshot of our system we're performing really well we exceed all the averages in terms of access to parkland and trails and open space but if you start to break it down into the components that we have the amenities the equitable share of the assets and the condition of those assets there's more to consider there um, so what you're going to see tonight is a, a study into kind of just the system components, really looking at parkland, parks, open space, and trails. We will start to touch on some of the um, amenities within those spaces. Um, 
but the future phases are really going to speak to um, more of a capital programming and planning um, kind of level. And so that has yet to be scoped or bid, but the intention is to move into that phase once this is completed. We have a pretty robust community engagement um, planned for this project. It is challenging at times to get people engaged in process, projects like this that's citywide and very high level. Um, we did have a community meeting already that was virtual, but we're planning a lot of pop-up events coming up in April and May. And so those are gonna be much more targeted focused conversations um, and more fun and interactive. And so we really want to make sure that we're engaging the entire community, especially community that's not necessarily regularly engaged in these types of efforts. So we're trying to be creative and strategic about how we do that. Um, let's see. So, let me go to the next slide. Um, Adrian Burton, Meredith, and Chelsea. <laughs> you probably recognize some of this team. Um, <clears throat> and we can skip that too. I've kind of gone, gone, already gone over that. So we're building on a lot of the work that's come before us. Um, we have reviewed South Suburban's recent master plan update they did in 2022, um, the city of Littleton's previous parks, recreation, and trails master plan, uh, the comprehensive plan, as well as the recently completed urban tree canopy. Those have provided a great foundation for the research um, as we began the existing conditions analysis. And then as Jim touched on, South Suburban is a very important stakeholder and partner in this process. Littleton owns a lot of the parkland. However, South Suburban is our provider as well as a provider to several other um, cities and towns. And um, yeah, so South Suburban maintains approximately 70% of those spaces while we, pr we cover about 25%. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Livable Cities to catch us up where we are. Great. Thanks, Adrian. So, yeah, just kind of want to highlight, um, and Jim had mentioned this before, kind of where we are in the process. This We're kind of in this step one called, you know, what we're calling kind of developing the vision. And then that future phase is step two, kind of the detailed recommendations. So that's that, like that, that, that piece of future work. But even within kind of developing the vision, we have been, um, we'll share with you tonight kind of our, um, the, the analysis that we've done on the system um, and some information there. We are in the middle of this um, kind of engagement mile Milestone, um, as, as Adrian mentioned, um, continuing to do a bunch of work, getting feedback on you know a lot of the information that, that you all hear tonight. Um, from here, we'll get into a draft vision, and then we'll come back out to the public, um, you know, in, in the summer, um, early in the fall, to just make sure that we heard people right, that we're um, that the vision is really resonating, um, and then obviously following that would be any future work that's decided upon at that time. Um, so just want to kind of dive into the community profile. Um, and, you know, this is really, as we start to do our work, you know, this is kind of the, the foundation of it, and you'll see kind of how it builds as I go through this. So um, I think some of this you all will uh, be very familiar with, but um, kind of looking at the population today, you know, just over 45,000 and um, kind of where it's projected to be in the next 10 years, um, we are kind of assuming a little bit of a slower growth rate um, at about 2% for Littleton. Um, slower than kind of the overall um, statewide um, population growth rate. And as we look, start looking into Littleton, you know, one thing we've been doing um, is that, and, and just to kind of reiterate what Adrian said, I mean, there is tremendous assets in Littleton, right? That is a, you know, there, there's amazing parks, open spaces. And, and when we've, we've looked at the kind of the city overall, but then we, we've also broken a lot of the information into the districts <coughs> because it's really important to understand kind of the, the four quadrants and, and where, you know, where people are and what they have access to and what are the different demographics. So um, as we really started to dig into it, we noticed that District 2 has um, the highest concentration of youth. And so as we think about parks and open spaces, this is really important. 20.5% um, of the population is, is under 18 team there. Um, District 4 has the highest concentration of the aging population, so that's above 65 at, um, you know, almost 25 percent. Um, and you can see how that's, you know, uh, markedly different than District 2, which is just over, you know, about 13 and a half percent. 
When we look um, at uh, different race and ethnicities, we have um, in District 2 the highest um, concentration of the Hispanic population, so about 24, 25 percent. And we're definitely taking this into account as we think about outreach and engagement, but also important to think about, um, you know, what that vision is and, and kind of um, the plan itself. Um, you can see District 1 at about almost 14 percent um, and, and <coughs> noticeably lower in, in 3 and 4. Um, as we look at the black or the African American population, um, fairly low overall, but um, the highest in District 2 at about 2.6%. Um, Asian population, um, District 3 has the highest, but nothing really uh, jumps out here. Um, you know, they're all kind of in between, you know, really 2 and 3% essentially. Um, we've looked at incomes, and uh, three and four have the highest incomes, you know, around 110,000, and you can see how that is noticeably different than um, District 2 at just under 55,000, average household income, that is. And so when we kind of look overall and start to layer all this information together, um, you you know, just to kind of quick summary, um, District 2 obviously is, we see the most amount of d diversity, a lot of younger residents, um, the lowest incomes up in that area, um, and then Districts 3 and 4, higher incomes, um, the, the aging population really, more, mostly in District 4. So getting into kind of the parks, open space, trails today. So everything I'm going to go through here is really just um, kind of our analysis into the system today, um, you know, all the parks and open space that exist. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about a number of different things and just to uh, kind of hit on some terminologies just so there's not any confusion. I think everyone think probably knows what open space is, most of the natural areas. Parks are, you know, are those darker green ones, obviously, on the map. Um, but I am going to use the term parkland, and that is a combination of parks and open space together. Um, and I'll kind of, I'll hit on that when I get there. But just to also show and, and share, right, that, that Littleton has tremendous assets. Um, over 500 acres of parks, over 1,000 acres of open space, and 40 miles of trails. Um, and I can speak to kind of how that stacks up to some of the um, uh, national standards as well as we move through these. So if you want to go to the next one. Um, so this is looking at parks. Um, so, you know, pocket parks, smaller spaces. This is where we see most of our picnic areas and playgrounds and, and some of the, the other um, active recreation elements. Um, you know, when we, when we break it up by district, you can see um, how each of the districts kind of stack up. So we look at, um, I, and I'll just give this kind of overall number. So um, citywide, it's 8.57 acres per thousand uh, residents. So that's kind of the metric we use to evaluate this. The South suburb, Suburban average is actually 6.39 per thousand. So Littleton is exceeding the South Suburban average um, for, for parks per, per thousand residents. Um, you can see here on this map that um, uh, District 4 is actually lacking access to parks, and we'll get into open space here in a minute, but it's only 3.9 acres per thousand residents. Um, and, and in the other districts, you can see a range of, you know, nine, nine acres and above per thousand. So, um, you know, really gr great kind of uh, uh, numbers there. Um, getting into open space, um, this is obviously where District 4 shines um, because of the great access down there. So the number is pretty much off the charts at 74.2 acres per thousand residents. Um, and just to step back and speak to kind of the citywide, so when you look at everything together, it's about 21.1 acres per thousand residents, so, um, which is higher than South Suburban at 11.3 acres per thousand. So again, great metrics. We're seeing um, good good uh, acreage here. Um, but obviously in District 1, 2, and 3, you see much lower numbers kind of uh, uh, related to open space. Um, and so this is where we look at them together. So parkland, again, is combining both parks and open space. Um, and you can see the numbers, obviously District 4 is really high because of, of, of that open space, but um, all in all, I think that we, we're seeing um, 
you know, pretty good numbers overall. The national average is 10.8 acres per thousand residents. So we're exceeding that um, just about in all cases or essentially meeting that. Um, looking at trails, this is really closely correlated to open space as well because we see so many trails in open space, especially along the South Platte. Um, but District 4 um, having the most at 16.3 uh, miles of trail and District 2 seeing the lowest at, at 3.6. The other way we look at this is um, park access. And so this um, kind of study is done just understanding kind of walkability um, to these parks. Um, and so that kind of dark purple area is uh, references a quarter mile walk, which is about a five minute walk. Um, and you can see how it scales up and half a mile um, is about a 10 minute walk. And so you can start to see kind of the coverage across the city and, and how, um, you know, I guess the percent coverage of the city having access to parks. So, um, you know, about 50% of the city is within a 10 minute walk of, the, of a park. Um, and then when you go and bump it out to one mile, you can, uh, you can see that about 75% of the city is within a 20 minute walk of the park. And District 4 being the area, um, and, and parts of District 1 as well, kind of on the western edge that are, uh, don't have as good access to parks. Um, but remember, this is looking at parks specifically, not open space. Um, and so just to kind of quickly summarize some of that, um, District 1, um, kind of lower access to overall parkland, but have, having kind of decent access to trails. District two is seeing lower access to trails and open space. Um, three has great access to parks, probably the best overall, kind of average to, to open space and trails. And district four, um, lower access to park, but parks, but you know, really great access to open space and trails. I just want to chime in here. I know I've talked to Jim about this, and I think he said, Adrian, the questions. I think when we kind of get through with the parks and open space and trails, you know, I know it's not part of this process right now, but as we move forward to look at what we have and what we want going forward, the kind of the definition of parks and open space and then even trails, when we're looking at disparity and equity between districts here, you know, I think, at least like in District 2, it's like, oh, there's not a lot of open space. You know, Kettering Park is mostly just open space. And there's a lot of it that's uh, trails that, you know, I don't think a lot of people think of it as a park per se like they would. Stern Park with the playground, thing like that. So I think, you know, as we move through the process, kind of having that uh, fine-tooth comb of exactly what we're talking about and what we mean. Um, well, and I would add, uh, I think if you look at the uh, um, map of the distances, there's a huge part of, of District 2 that is, they're very close to pocket parks, and these pocket parks are teeny weeny, and I'm not confident we should... I, I think I'm saying the same thing as Kyle, but I don't think we should count access to a pocket park as the same as access to a, a larger park. Um, and then what, there's like this little white area on top of Kettering Park that like isn't close. To, I don't understand the map. Like that's part of the, the to the east of it right there. Yeah. Am I so just, that's the walkability that you can't actually access it if you were to go down in Lakeview. You'd have to walk all the way up Lakeview past your house back around to access the park because there's no way to get through the backyard of people. So that's that part of the neighborhood that's in Aberdeen that's... Oh. Since oh. you're walking, you're not unless people are running through your yard and jumping your fence and stuff. Uh, that's not how it actually works in practice. I mean, there are literally hundreds of people walk past my house to get into the park. I'm just thinking it's that's that, that spot right there. Is yeah, that, no, I... What do you think of the GIS data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Even, that's even taking the people that back to the park because they have to go out their front door. You know, they don't have to, but GIS says you have to walk around. To get I, I have a key. Yeah. I have a key. <laughs> Great. Sorry. Thank you very much. But that is something we've noticed, and um, you know, we're aware of for the next phase is just being more consistent with the park classification typologies um, because we've noticed some discrepancies, and so getting those very well defined and then consistently applied yeah, yeah. and really defining important. what what makes a park right mm -hmm. what are the attributes and the amenities that should be in them versus you know in open space and and so yeah. on and so forth and you know this is very much kind of you know 
it, it, it's not getting at the qualitative aspect, obviously, right? And when you mentioned kind of the pocket park, so this is, you know, that that's the other piece that, you know, we'll, we'll get into here in a second and we want more in feedback on. This is kind of the, um, the, the quant quantitative uh, yeah, analysis here, obviously. Yeah, the, the yeah. baseline. And then one of the other things that I mentioned that's not shows up in this is, you know, schools. Uh, but they're not parks, but after school hours, lots of people utilize their yeah, facilities. I mean, as <laughs> and I think East... The east is shown as a park because I think South Suburban, and so I'm wondering if, if we're consistently showing schools as open space because um, the I think the yeah we're, we're not, not showing, showing schools, schools in this this, this yeah this is that's I'm ninety percent sure that's East Elementary yeah and I okay. think we had one that was classified from South Suburban and it's South Suburban yeah. manages manages yeah. some of that space so. Yeah. But you're right. We should look at schools because I think everybody considers Runyon as an open space. There, that's right. Yeah. So and you could. And you know, I know with the disparities of you know between four and two, one of the things I was thinking about just is you know open spaces in terms of people's yards. How many playgrounds are in the backyards of people in District Four? So is access to a park all that important if everyone has their own little playground? Versus District Two, not everyone has. You know, a lot of people don't have their own playground equipment in their backyard because. Small backyards or no backyards, just yeah, yeah, no, deeper I, thinking. That's, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, not part of this right here. So. And our our analysis is focused within the boundary of the city. However, we are considering, and it will be something we'll speak to in the overall plan mm -hmm. about access to parks that are right on the boundary or really in close proximity. We're asking in the survey, you know, what are you leaving the city for currently to? Um, for recreation purposes, and so that that's just something that we are considering as well, but you don't necessarily see it reflected in the analysis. And it's right important now. as we get into that with South Suburban, because, you know, we talk about stuff like, oh, well, you have access to all this stuff through South Suburban, but, you know, you may have access to it 45 minutes away in Lone Tree, but how many people are going to go utilize that? Yeah, flip side is people next to Cup Cornerstone. That's the, yeah, that's, I just think it's funny. It's a half mile walk to Cornerstone for people that live... 30 feet from it because yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not included in this because it's outside the city. Right. Yeah. right. Great. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I want my district to have a different color. So. <laughs> <laughs> that we can't accommodate. <laughs> <laughs> that totally, totally not about this. Great. Um, well, I'll speak to some activities and amenities in Littleton today and consider some national trends and, and what that means for Littleton. I wanted to start off by highlighting all the opportunities that residents have today. So not exclusive, but um, a lot of traditional recreation elements like playgrounds, courts, baseball fields, athletic fields, as well as rec centers. Um, some more social spaces like picnic areas, shelters, community event spaces, community gardens, and some more outdoor recreation opportunities, so trails and areas to explore the natural world. And when we look nationally, in general, um, people are participating in recreation more often. So in 2022, 77% of Americans uh, participated in at least one activity. And some categories are growing um, in popularity faster than others. So that includes outdoor sports and racket sports, um, primarily pickleball, which we'll touch on in a moment here. Um, but we did just want to acknowledge that there is a um, discrepancy and a gap between um, those with higher incomes, they participate more, um, and those with lower incomes, they participate less. So we thought that was important to note here. Can I ask one real quick question yeah. before you start going into the details of the activities. So, po you know, COVID had like an anomalous effect on outdoor recreation participation. Mm -hmm. And are, from your experience, are you seeing numbers kind of rebounding back to where they were pre-COVID? Or are you actually seeing kind of a steady, like a significant difference between now, you know, ish yeah. and that pre-COVID time period? So yeah, we've been using the NRPA data, which puts out an annual report every year. So this one, that these numbers all came from the 2022 report. So there are some interesting findings between COVID and, and now, um, like fitness sports, which are categorized as, you know, those classes indoors have uh, plummeted completely. Um, and outdoor sports, I think that's really directly related to needing to be outside. So definitely seeing trends and um, it's 
being noted in the national data for sure. Yeah, and just to add, I, I'm not sure that we're, we've seen the data that it's rebounded back to pre-COVID necessarily. Um, there was clearly a big shift in COVID and maybe more of a stabilization. I have, right, I mean, unless Chelsea, you have, no, I haven't right. seen that data that's, that's shown that's kind of gone back to any sort of pre-COVID numbers. So that. like we do all need to be kind of considering the fact that service levels need, track, need to be increasing right. kind of overall because you know, the event we have all collectively experienced has changed our attitude about sports, outdoor recreation, and all that. Yeah, kind of and stuff. I think that also COVID changed certain populations and the way they interacted in the outdoors. But, you know, especially in some lower income communities, they didn't have that, you know, necessarily the kind of access that others did. So the, the needs kind of were markedly different, I think, in, in COVID. And, and through some of our research on some other stuff, that's what we've really found, that just the barriers remain in those lower income neighborhoods where they, the, the higher income areas just didn't have those kind of barriers to the outdoors. Certainly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so looking at the data nationally, we wanted to highlight a few activities that are really seeing an increase in popularity. I mentioned pickleball, um, we'll also talk about skate features and disc golf. Um, and we will look at what that means for Littleton. Um, before we do that, we wanted to highlight the amenities that are within Littleton today um, and access to them. So what you're seeing on this slide, we took national data um, that had the median number of residents per, per facility. And we benchmark that national data um, for a municipality of Littleton size against what Littleton has today. So you'll see the amenities in the left-hand side, um, but any circle that's not filled in notes that Littleton could stand to increase access to those amenities. Uh, the half-filled circle indicates it's doing pretty well, pretty on spot with that national average. And then the filled-in circle means that Littleton is doing better than the national average overall. Um, so if we quickly look through these together, um, playgrounds, specifically in districts one, two, and four, could use um, an increase to meet that national average. Uh, dog parks, while district one has good access to that, districts the, two, three, the single, and The four. single dog park? Yes. <laughs> the <laughs> single <laughs> dog park? Less access in others, yes. Would like to park, let's go over that. Access to tennis courts could be improved citywide. Um, plenty of shelters. There's not actually national data to benchmark that against. Um, both for baseball fields and more general multi-purpose athletic fields. Um, the city's doing good, if not great, everywhere. Uh, and then basketball doing pretty mm -hmm. well, as, um, except District 3 could use an increase in access. So, yeah, just to Adrian's point, you know, access to these amenities is, yeah, it gets a bit more granular when we look by district. I'm interested you didn't do golf. Yes. Um, I believe golf is, I'm not sure that we have the national data for that, as so much golf is private. The national data is all for public assets. Um, yeah. Because I feel like that's another one of our assets. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Could, we could dig into that. Yeah, we yeah. could dig into it. I, I don't, I'm not. Tennis. Tennis. Yeah, I'm not necessarily asking you to benchmark it, but I think it's one of our assets. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Great. It is. It's also it's kind of a niche thing. It's like, oh, the equestrian access to. I mean, just I, I, I get your point, but I, I think I think white like dudes everywhere took an umbrage to I, golf <laughs> as a weird sport. I'm okay with it. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I, I do. Oh, with that, with me or with him? Yeah. Yeah. With it. <laughs> with me attacking the old white dudes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is, I play golf, and I'm not an old white dude. I, I'm sorry. I, I know. I, I, I'm, uh, I've stirred a pot in a way that's not helpful with the conversation. So. For later. I, I know that in the preliminary analysis that we did see that, you know, the um, top golf type facilities, those were increasing in participation, but more traditional wasn't really having a large increase. Yeah. No, I think golf is struggling as an industry, yeah. but mm -hmm. uh, it's just one of our assets. Mm -hmm. so, uh, sure. I'm sorry, I, I took yeah. us way off. Doesn't Littleton Golf and Tennis is not even up there, right? Well, well the tennis court is. It's where the pink tennis court is? Yeah, but... We don't have... It, he's saying there's golf is not, not there. Idea. He's saying golf is not on the table. I, I understand that, but tennis doesn't have any little half circle or anything. 
Because it's not benchmarked. Because it means we're not. We need work. They're, we're they're advocating that we have more tennis, tennis, tennis courts in our town. We're lacking. Mm -hmm. national There's national typically a lot access. more tennis courts mm -hmm. nationally. We don't have few tennis courts, is what it's saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's marked there, yeah, but we only above have average, below average. four so locations for tennis courts. I've never thought that we need work. Oh, that's four guys. Maybe there's more tennis courts where it's warmer. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, people are playing more pickleball than tennis, aren't they? Yeah, that's, pickleball that's is the trend is growing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll speak to that now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good segue there, Pam. <laughs> yeah. 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 about the presenters. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All my neighbors go to Parker. <clears throat> I just light them all up. Yeah, so we did look at pickleball and access in Littleton. So there's three facilities today and one facility in its design phase, which is Mission Viejo on the southern edge of town there. But we counted that in our analysis and it totals uh, 30 courts. Um, but when we look at those national standards, um, Littleton would need to add a few more of those courts to reach that national average. Looking at skate features, uh, within Littleton there's Promise Park, which has a handful of skate features. You can see that photo in the center. Skate dot, um, that's a new term. <laughs> yes, categorized as a skate dot, which, yeah, definitely on the smaller side. Um, there are six additional facilities, all within a two-mile buffer of the city boundary, that provide a variety of experiences all the way up to a regional skate park. Um, but even when we take all of those into account, um, it still could use some improved access based on the national standard. And lastly, we will look at disc golf specifically. And you can see um, both District 1 and District 3 have a course. Um, but there are four additional courses, all within a two-mile buffer of the city boundary. Um, just getting really, really popular. Since 2021, disc golf has um, courses have increased 13% nationwide. Um, so again, looking at those national numbers, it could use um, improved access. And Just got a bunch of hippie guys walking around putting sticks on the ground with uh, so I better myself. <laughs> you don't need geometrically appropriate fields. You can just work in spaces that are not appropriate for other types of recreational exactly. activity. And these, the, what we're covering, aren't necessarily recommendations we're making. They're just really showing where those national trends are and <laughs> how we perform against those. Um, so it's not, we're not limiting to those options necessarily. Do we have any programs that would count as wilderness programs being run out of Carlson Winter Center? Mm -hmm. They do, yeah. I don't have the full details on those, but I know they have some transportation <coughs> opportunities yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so these are just a few other trends we wanted to highlight. Uh, bike facilities, water elements, adventure activities like zip line are getting more popular. We mentioned the dog parks, climbing elements and wilderness programs. Yeah, like happening at Carson, but um, yeah, so Littleton does have access to <clears throat> parkland, doing excellent, and a lot of amenities, but we wanted to just highlight as part of our research. I have a broader question, and this might be for you, Reed. As we, <laughs> <laughs> as we think about you know, these trends like in skate parks and some of these other, is there added risk? Um, in the design of our parks and things like that, that take in some of these activities? I think in terms of design, assuming that we've properly designed it, um, there shouldn't be any additional risk. We're protected by uh, Colorado Governmental Immunity Act. There's certain recreational acts that would uh, protect this. In the she clearly did not grow up in the 80s with those hot metal <laughs> slides <laughs> and, and everything else that we... So you're saying there are acts that protect our the cities from <clears throat> something if someone's enjoying a park and hurts themselves. Yeah, Say someone climbs a tree and falls out of the tree and breaks, breaks their arm, arm during a concert, just yeah. hypothetically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So that is taking into account anything South Suburban offers from like Carson Nature Center. Yes. Yeah. And we'll shift um, Meredith will cover some of our community engagement yeah. efforts. I get, oh, sorry. But I would also add because of the plat, we have fishing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, or we used it to catch tadpoles. Marketed at my pond, but 
<laughs> there is still fishing in my pond. <laughs> No, that's a great point. And, you know, by no means are some of the activities and the trends that you see here, you know, comprehensive of, of everything. We and, and that, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we don't have it. But yes, fishing is actually on the list. I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of things, too, even like winter. Well, the other thing, sorry, like for my part, I think Kettering is one of the few parks where people could fly drones. And so the number of people who come to Kettering to fly drones is pretty... I mean, there's there's probably somebody there every day flying a drone or two a couple drones, which is also creepy and weird in some ways. If you think about that, but yeah, that's great. Okay, so just I want to share just a little bit about some of the engagement that we're doing. Um, kind of just a reminder of the timeline here that we have these two engagement phases and. One thing, you know, as you all saw how we're breaking up the city, kind of looking at the detail and the different, um, the, the council districts, we're also, as we get feedback, we're asking which council district they live in. Um, and be, so that we can actually kind of analyze the data accordingly um, to get just that, that more at a more granular level. Um, so we are in that first phase of engagement. We have, um, we've had a community-wide virtual meeting. We'll be doing pop-ups and tabling, um, small group meetings. We have a story map, which is that kind of uh, virtual or online platform um, with a survey link to it. Um, and then we're sharing out other information as much as possible. You can see on the right there how we're promoting this. So if you all have seen some of this information, um, that's great and you'll know what it is. Um, social media, yard signs, we've been doing flyering, we've done direct outreach to, to people. Um, and we've also utilized a list of kind of stakeholders and partners and reached out to schools as well um, to push out all this communication, the communications about this project. Where are your pop-ups and tablings? We are working through um, that right now. Um, we are planning to focus events in each district, mm -hmm. so we're looking for those key locations. So if you have recommendations and you think of something, we're also looking to find existing events that are going on, if there's a way that we could you know, show up and, and be a, a presence there. I just uh, One thing I think should be on the trails. I mean, actually yes. people walking, running, biking. That's definitely a big focus area we hope to, and we're, we're looking for very interactive exercises, so gumballs and, you know, where would you put your gumballs in terms of investments in the parks, um, social media kind of things, uh, ways to get families involved, youth involved, and um, encourage people to spend five, ten minutes of their time just talking to us, so. Yeah. PTO yeah. meetings might be a good place. Yeah, absolutely. What kind of meetings? PTO. So if you want to access PTO, let me know. Which sure, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. So we've been reaching out, like all of our communications, these stakeholders, um, and so if there's any, any group you all think is missing, please let us know. Um, but they've been receiving all the information about the meetings and um, the survey, and so we are, we are we reaching as wide as possible to really get the feedback during this phase. And so what we're working on now, and the questions for you all, um, survey promotion is really our big thing right now. We have, uh, on the right there, you can see the little bookmark that we've been sharing out um, to get uh, people to scan the QR code and, and take the survey. Um, as part of the survey, we've also been asking people if they're interested in a small group, kind of focus group meeting. And so we've got actually a lot of people responding with interest. So we are going to set up a number of those meetings um, and hold them um, in you know, the next few months. Doing pop-ups, as, as we mentioned, yeah, trailheads, parks, and any other kind of co-locating at other events. Um, so all ideas would be very much welcome from you all. And we're definitely trying to get, you know, cover the entire city and make sure we have good coverage in all the districts. Um, and like I said, we're, you know, working with those community partners to um, be sensitive to some communities that may not, um, in districts you may not engage the same way and, and, you know, making sure that we're going, kind of what I say, like meeting people where they are um, in a comfortable way for them that, um, so we can get their feedback. Have you reached out to the Littleton Independent at all? It'd be great if Nina Joss, the writer for the Littleton Independent, were happen to watch this and write an article about this to get the word out about this, right, Nina? With two or somebody we know connected to Littleton Public Schools that may have <laughs> contacts 
I already offered the PTO contact. <laughs> I think that there's a way to do that. Or, or, or even a flyer that go if we if there's a way that the schools would allow the city to have flyers go home to with the kids, the parents. Yeah, yeah. I always know when I have to uncrumple the piece of paper that's in my child's backpack to figure out what it was about. Exactly. And take a look at it. So that might be hopefully the QR code works after being crumpled. Yeah. Well, and having worked with South Suburban for many years as the other time, I'm thrilled to death because I felt like our open space plan is dated and not very prescriptive. And I think we need to have our voice of our community on what we do because when it comes to South Suburban budget, it's very structured. It's a year to get it on the budget. Once it gets on the budget, it's a year to design it, and then it's a year to build it. So they don't turn very easily. And so as a result, we need to start, and we've done it informally, but I think this will really help this whole process, get the community involved. Mm -hmm. um, we want. So we also have some yard signs placed in key parks. Um, we've really tried to hit every district to make sure that we're sharing that information. We can provide flyers, uh, bookmarks, if you have any events that you're going to and want to carry some along with you. Um, but again, if we're missing some key stakeholders or if you can think of anybody else that we should be... Well, Andrew and I are having a meeting in April. So we can, oh, wonderful. <coughs> those flyers and we can put them on the desk. Fantastic. Thank you. A uh, little Adventist. Oh, yeah. Breakfast with okay. Does this want people to get involved? Well, the, commu the new community center is that on there? Mm -hmm. uh, that was not listed up here, but we are we are in communication with them. Even flyers at all the the rec center. And we have posted um, flyers and the bookmarks in those locations, um, and the bookmarks have been really successful. They're very transportable and for the purpose. So. I wonder if the. Downtown Merchants mm -hmm. Association would be interested in distributing some of those bookmarks to the, some of the stores down, to, or some maybe just the chamber in general, but engaging our. Uh, yeah, I think they'd be really interested in that. If one of you could just go to their mm -hmm. meeting, we'll have Jamie. She goes pretty yeah. regularly. Just have her hand those out, and they would put. If you had a big stack, they would put them in their stores. Yeah, that's, a, yep. that's not a hard. Yeah, it doesn't have to be downtown. Yeah, good idea, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> I have a, speaking of South Suburban, I have a question going all the way back to the beginning of slide six. I don't know if it's for Jim or for Reed or for you, or I'm assuming no one has the answer, but the fact that South Suburban is our parks district and we own, what was it, 60% of our park land, but South Suburban maintains it. I guess the big picture, big question, why do we own parkland if South Suburban's our park district and they maintain it? And why do we maintain parkland if I'm just trying to figure out what's the, it's a interesting, unique relationship. And I think that's kind of, it's complex with, with that. I'll say I think there hasn't been a lot of attention to the service agreement for okay. many years. <laughs> um, I think that is, I've certainly heard that, that interest from council. You know, there are financial trade-offs with any kind of change in that balance and that we're all I think ready for that. Um, but that's those are some of the questions that when we actually, you know, when we have the, the the results from this visioning plan and council can put a, a finer point on some of our our interests in, in either service levels or this these balances, um, we can delve more into that. Yeah. Because I'm not say, suggesting that we should do either sell all of our land or give all of our land to South Suburban, or the inverse of that is, you know, you know, if, we're, if we own all this, why don't we have our own uh, parks district, park district, I mean, is it? They did a quick and dirty analysis of that, and it was very expensive to pull all those services in-house. That, I mean, yeah. I mean it, like expensive. millions. Yeah, I know parks, that, that's, I mean, that's why we have all these special districts that do that. Right. I mean, it works and everything else, but it's just, if we're making policies, policy decisions for our constituents here and we own land and have them just you know have all the information I'm not saying we should do either one but just it's helpful to kind of know I mean the thought of having control is nice but it's mm -hmm. expensive this who, way they scale who's the other or in the 24 yeah that was the other question who else owns is it would that be like GoCo and the water board in and everything contractors um, so well, mostly in South Platte Park and along yeah, the river yeah, who owns the South Platte Park is that a really yeah. stupid question? Corps of Army Engineers. Yeah, it's Army Corps. It's yeah. split and, yeah. It, it, there's lots there's of parcels. There's a lot of parcels, parcels in there. Yeah. So some Littleton, some 
water board. Um, so, and that's consistent in all of our parks. There's probably quite a bit of cleanup that needs to be done there just to, uh, yeah, for the classification piece. So it feels like we're assuming we're done as a city buying new parks, new land for parks? No, not necessarily. I mean, it feels like, in particular with Nor Norgen, Norgren? thank you, changing their you know their status in the city, that feels like a, an opportunity we should consider learning about and trying to be able to respond to. I mean, even in the last six years, I know when I was in the first time, I think you guys had a meeting about parcel of land um, purchased for park, and it was just too expensive and didn't fit in. So there's still opportunities here and there. I'd say like the uh, Superchi parcel or something was that is a, coming to the city. We do have an open space fund that we throw money in to their money gets deposited into, excuse me, every year um, from various sources that can be used to help fund. Right now it's a lot of kind of the right-of-way access and trail improvements, but assuming that there was an identified amount of money, you could certainly pursue some of these parcels that come on the market. There's, I know. there's not a whole lot of opportunities, Correct. but they still exist. Like Superchi is south of Reynolds Landing. There is a, there is a house there, oh, okay. um, kind of between Breckenridge Brewery and right there. Uh -huh. that was yep. uh, purchased by the city, to, and that's part of the Reynolds Landing. Gotcha, gotcha. So, I mean, because, yeah. I mean, I think, and there are multiple kind of opportunities to fund if there's different ways to fund this stuff it just you got to you need a you need a runway to get yes. to get access to that money and i would say that you know parks if we were to get serious about it are no different than other types of infill development you know it's it would be a significant you know purchase for the city you know i don't i have no concept right now what that would look like but i think we should approach green space open space, um, you know, as we're looking at the rest of our community developing. You know, we'll see that in, in small scale as we look, I presume, as we look at the uh, project <coughs> project downtown options, we'll see green space and, you know, I, I think that's, it's just another component of our uh, more and more urban landscape. Well, um, I mean, we're we going to have fewer and fewer opportunities. Many communities are more proactive and have funds and have have you know tax taxing sources for acquisition of uh, parks and open space. And there's a lot more undeveloped land, right? Which other communities as well. That's the hard thing. There's not a whole lot. You know, no, no. I, I guess what I'm saying is we're, we're going to run out of chances, and we should be. Um, <laughs> I'd be interested in be, you know having whatever conversation we can when opportunities there's arise. There's a lot of land to the south of us. He plays. He plays risk. Uh, <laughs> uh, annexation. All this unincorporated areas. <laughs> um, to echo a, an earlier comment from from our city manager, you know, he spoke about kind of the service plan that exists between South Suburban and the city of Littleton. That is something that really has not been updated. I know it's been something that we've talked about as an organization over the years, and I know we've expressed interest in exploring that agreement, but it has not been up, updated it since probably the '60s. Maybe there was one amendment. Regarding voting. And did Lone Tree update their agreement and couldn't we just use that as some sort of a template? I mean, is it, it's not like starting, starting from scratch, right? I, I'm not sure. What well, they're based on what amenities you have. I mean, yeah. they don't. Yeah, but it's not like we're, I mean, we could customize it. I mean, there's a, what I'm saying is there, a, there is a more current one there is out there. There is a more there. current one, yes. And with, that will certainly inform us okay. as to the kinds of, of agreements that municipalities are making with South Suburban. Um, I, you know, but uh, needless to say, our profile and kind of needs are going to be different than a lone tree who has, you know, who is developing and who does have revenues for uh, acquisition. Because I thought that was scheduled to be updated like in December, last December, and I don't, it doesn't seem like we're anywhere close to that. So that was part of the original scope that Jim was speaking Oh, so to. now that's been put off? Yeah. But we'll, we'll um, follow this process. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of going hand in hand. Um, Just on a different timeline and a different budget that we had expected. Yeah. So. 
That makes Once we sense. get the community Skype, that will feed into the service agreements based on what our residents want to see. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I've given you guys kind of feedback on kind of minor points. The major point of feedback I would like you to consider is thinking more about connectivity mm -hmm. and thinking about how to engage the transportation um, community around how do people get to parks mm -hmm. um, and 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 just are neighborhoods connected. Mm -hmm. And obviously the trails is a part of that conversation, but not the whole part. And so mm -hmm. for the work, you're, I'm really excited about the work you're doing. And, and I, you know, I've given some minor things, but I want to be clear that the thing I really care about is connectivity. Yeah, and we'll share the survey with everybody. We, we are asking about you know, critical connections, and that's something we'll be exploring. Um, I'd say with the preliminary feedback that we can see from the survey's trails have, have definitely risen to the top, but that transportation piece is so key in ensuring that that connection runs through. We've heard about interior trails as opposed to the exterior trails as well um, from a variety of different perspectives on usability and um, how well you can access them. So definitely a part of the consideration with this effort and really important we can tell with the community. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think the walking to Kettering Park, I think, is easier than was described in your map. But I think what people care about also is safely biking to all these things. And I think mm -hmm. thinking about, so when I say connectivity, I mean really safely biking and walking. Yeah. And the, the quality of that five-minute mm -hmm. walk, because it may be, you know, parking across Broadway or just you know, there's some street that may not really actually be that easy or safe to get to. And then, like you, with the connectivity of the, the trails, like you know, Kettering, you know, District three, District Two has almost no trails, but Kettering's got you know a couple miles of trails in there, depending on which way you go. So, but it's, it's not almost exactly a mile. Well, there's multiple. There's multiple know, trails too. So. Um, and then um, I really like the view by district. I think that was a great way of breaking it. Up. I really appreciate doing that. Uh, you know, one of the key goals from the 2016 Parks Open Space Trails Master Plan was updating the agreement. So this vision piece with those considerations will really help meet those objectives and goals and really help us set us up for that next phase of this work with the capital programming piece where we can start to better define park typology, what's going in there. Um, there's a lot of things that will come from that. Um, so kind of setting us up for, yeah, really meeting those, those needs. And for your... The last slide, the engagement for community members to reach out to them. Plug, Councilmember Wright here for the the HOAs. And, you know, we need to get the that list of HOAs and have those connections because that that's a good way to get information out and get information back. Absolutely, we're really trying to identify those individual community champions that can help us make those direct connections and relationships with people that aren't necessarily plugged into kind of the standard. Um, but even, I mean, not, not even people, I mean, I don't live in an HOA, but other, either, yeah. that's just easy avenue to get out there. They have newsletters and things like that. How often people read them, who knows, but at least you can put it out there and there's a better chance of people and reading something. They have websites and they have meetings. Yeah. yeah. I know the list of HOAs is hard to get. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Step, so yeah, the, target, yeah. yeah. Step three is actually going to be um, virtual parts. No, so free so time. We'll, we'll <laughs> right. Inside. That's called Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we, so we the other thing would be churches. Yeah. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. we've got to so prioritize it. Many of these stakeholder and outreach groups that you've identified on here is actually kind of pulling from a very similar, if not same, with the exception of LPS um, demographic. And I think my only ask and hopefully take away from this is that when we actually see the data coming back from survey respondents and the like, that it is um, especially not only matching the kind of diverse ethnic backgrounds that we have throughout the city that are much less likely to be respondents to surveys. Right. And we've seen this in our past survey data, but in addition that under 35 age demographic, again, notoriously difficult to capture in survey material. And they're not going to be doing small group meetings. They're not going to be responding to email surveys that, like, you have to physically grab their face and then ask them a question. And I will say just up front that I hope, I, I mean, obviously all these stakeholders are important in this process, but where concerns like that true representation of what those demographics actually desire, I hope we, we don't do statistical math to extrapolate based on the one person that happen to wander into the survey group, that we are proactively seeking that engagement. And I think 
LPS, you will need to get creative. And I am happy to spend more money on the work and the contract vehicle if it's necessary to get to that level of engagement. But what I don't want to come back out of this is literally the exact same demographic makeup that we see in a lot of our different community engagements and surveys. It just takes more work and money and effort. There's no way around it. Yeah, and, and totally agree. And I think what we see when we do outreach like this, the survey data is going to be a certain demographic, right? And as hard as we try, they're just populations that will not engage. Right. So that's why we supplement and we go to them, right? We That's where the pop-ups come in. That's where these, you know, certain small group meetings, so there's the ones we might convene and they're likely going to be some others that we go to. And we also will tailor the questions and what we ask to kind of right size it for the amount of time people have um, because of all of those reasons you just mentioned. Yeah, and, and okay. trying to build some relationships in advance too. So we're not we're not strangers coming, we're familiar and um, we can also build that relationship for other outreach that we're doing and it's not a standalone necessarily, but again, we become familiar and um, they understand how valuable their voice is in the process, so. Do we use our boards? at all for communication on this? Like Arts and Culture Board or? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah we should probably take something yeah. over. Yeah. 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 So there's a couple yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, Littleton yeah. Golf and Tennis and Buck are on that list. Of places that you might put a QR code oh, to sure. take the survey. Yeah, yeah she said that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did this you is a there? We don't necessarily have their yeah. 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 Do you have it open yet? The survey yes. we do, so we'll share that link. Where is it? It's on the project webpage under it's the littletongovorg slash root and redo. I've seen it on you know social media. Yeah. Let me, let me push it. And we are putting it out on Littleton Report online every couple weeks, um, and then yeah, using additional social media posts to help promote it as well. One of you just send it to me really quickly. Yeah. Text it to you right now. Oh, Adrian, I feel like you didn't, you skipped right past your picture slide. Oh. And I really appreciate that because I can't remember anybody's name. So <laughs> that was a really good part of it. I look a little different. <laughs> uh, you and me, buddy, in the same yeah. way. Just yeah. don't feel embarrassed about that. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's right in the back of the room. room. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll still send that out and um, uh, make sure that flyers, bookmarks, and things available if you want to have any of those. Thank you for the time tonight. Appreciate it. And we'll be back uh, to hear more from you by late summer. And so we'll be in communication. So I really appreciated the economic um, analysis by district. I would be really interested in seeing the report time range from the 25th. 50 percentile mm -hmm. each of those measures, mm -hmm. and obviously not percent Wait. of the <laughs> Are we having a side conversation or part of the <laughs> just we do have consultant to consultant yeah, yeah. kind of conversation? Not, not during the meeting here. Yeah. <laughs> we do have that data. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. I was asking for more data. I know, but yeah. the public and everyone else needs to be able to hear. Okay. <laughs> Change over to the communications team. I'm just yes. curious. Uh, in this <laughs> your, your IT tech here. Oh, oh. Oh, you want to take five? Yeah. All right, we're going to take a five minute recess. As long as the five comes from Kelly Hardy's presentation. <laughs>
Okay, good evening, Council. I'm Kelly Nardi. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing, and I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to kind of get you caught up on what our department does. Um, we are one of the few departments within the city that is both an internal and an external service department. Um, I'm going to go through who our team members are. We currently have six full-time employees and one part-time um, employee in our graphic design. And then we have three part-time employees, one of which I think you know very well. And we have Kim, Caitlin, and Ben, who are um, media producer engineers who help us televise the city council meetings and five other council-appointed boards that meet in this building. Uh, we also have Kathy Weaver who's my right hand. Um, she's been with me for a very, very long time. She's our deputy communications director. Um, she's the one that keeps everything going. Um, Carla uh, Max is our full-time graphic designer in creative services. She's great. <laughs> she is great. Um, Katie is our part-time graphic designer in creative services. I think uh, at your council workshop, you saw a good um, example of the kind of work that they do with the big boards that were on the wall and you got to place your outcomes on the boards. Carla uh, put all that together in pretty short order. Did she get our gratitude? Yeah, kudos. I um, nominated her today for a Work Tango Award, so yeah, she'll get it. Um, David Gilbert, who I think you all know, is our media strategist. Um, David's been with us a couple of years. Uh, he's a former um, reporter. Uh, then we have that against him, though, do you? <laughs> no, it's, it's been an asset. It really has. Um, he's wonderful. He can take a very complicated topic and um, write about it in a way that people really can understand it. Um, Tyler is our senior media producer engineer. I think you guys all know uh, what a great asset he is for this city. Um, He's just, he's our tech genius. He can, as you will know, he can fix anything. And tomorrow he'll be meeting with one of our vendors to look at acquiring a new audio processor for this room because, as you well know, um, we're going to need to replace the one that's um, working sometimes here. Um, and then Elizabeth Schofield is our uh, senior events and marketing manager. Um, Elizabeth is responsible for all of our major events. Um, we do 11 of those a year, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, then we just extended an offer yesterday for our summer intern. So um, Annika Groom will be joining us this summer. She's a senior at the University of Arizona, majoring in e-society, and um, which is a new one. I'd never heard that before. Never heard it. And then we are very grateful to City Council for approving a new position in the 2024 budget. So we'll be hiring a junior digital media strategist. I spent most of today reviewing those applications. We had 68 applications, and we've narrowed it down to 40. So I'm reviewing all Four 40 zero? of those. Excuse me? 4-0? Four 4-0. Zero. Four zero. Yeah, I'm at about 28. It's a, it's a big endeavor. Oh, I think I went too far. I did. It's so touchy. <laughs> uh, some of the things we do, um, content creation and citizen engagement. We try to tell the story of the city of Littleton, all the programs, um, projects, services that the city is involved with, we try to tell that story to our citizens. We do that through the Littleton Report. We do the um, six issues of that per year. It's mailed to 22,000 postal patrons in the city. That's every commercial and uh, residential address. The Littleton Report Online was something that we started during the pandemic because there was obviously a great need to communicate more frequently than with people than every other month. And so we started doing that on a weekly basis. What's your open rate on that? It's so high. It's like 57% open rate. So the Littleton Report um, online outperforms other governmental um, um, newsletters. online newsletters. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's very well read. How many um, people get we have paper 30, copy? We have 3,300 people that subscribe to the Littleton Report online. What was your question? 28,000, I said. She said, how many does it go to? Yeah. Paper seven. Um, we do photography, videography, press releases. You might have read one that I wrote last week. Um, and, and writing. 
Um, we're also responsible for all the city's social media channels. It's pretty centralized. There are some side social media channels, um, but we're very careful. I was talking to somebody, one of my peers in another city that said they had like 30 different social media platforms throughout their organization, like their community development department had one. And, you know, so the museum and the library and the police department have them, but otherwise we keep things very central because we have more than 50,000 followers on our four major social media platforms. So we want to leverage that. It doesn't make sense for one department to start a social media channel and have a couple hundred people when we can leverage, you know, thousands. And though that 50,000 is not unique people, and it's not 100% people who live in the city. Or 100% people. people, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it might not even be. It might be some bots in there. Um, but we're on Facebook, X, Nextdoor, and Instagram. We do 11 major special events per summer. Um, the Criterium and the Candlelight Walk are our two big ones. We do four Little Jam concerts every summer. We do three meet, greet, and eats every summer. We do the board and commission dinner, and we do the state of the city. And uh, our department right now is like in full-blown event mode because it's all, it's all coming right around the corner. Um, we do every element of those events, including... Most events we do, we have to fill out four different permits. We do a City of Littleton event permit. We do a permit with South Metro Fire Rescue. Um, we do one with South Suburban if we're going to be using one of their parks. And then we do liquor permits. So think about 11 events and all those permits. It's an awful lot of permits. Those fees get waived? They do not get waived. We don't charge us the... Um, $25 as a nonprofit. Uh, but we do pay South Metro and we do pay South Suburban. Um, we well, have we pay South Suburban mm -hmm. to use our parks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else find that kind of weird? <clears throat> they have to clean up after it. Okay. 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 Keep going. It works out well because we, you know, in a, by filling out their permit, like they're aware of our event. They don't turn the sprinklers on. They make sure. The trash cans are empty, so they make sure the park is ready for us. Um, on Comcast Cable Channel 8, we run a 24-7, 365-day-a-year cable television channel. Um, channel 8 is conveniently located <coughs> between Channel 7 and Channel 9, and so you can't imagine how many people stumble into Channel 8 and see a documentary or a city council meeting or a planning commission meeting. So... Um, it's very hard to measure the viewership on that, but, you know, we get a lot of feedback from people about Channel 8. And, you know, that 24-7, 365 cable channel is managed by one person, and that's Tyler. Have you scheduled our newest members to do their little... Uh, I'm behind. That's me. Um, I'm the problem. It's me. Andrea did it, I, and Gretchen I, did a new one. I just no, that was my first one. It just took me two years. <laughs> but you got around to it. I'm that that counts. Who, who runs our it's new compared to the one that didn't exist. Yeah. So since the beginning, our department ran the main city webpage about two years ago, I believe. Our IT department took over running the website, and then we got a new domain name, so it went from littletongov.org to littletonco.gov, and IT runs it now. Um, as you know, we televise this meeting on Channel 8, and we live stream it, um, and then we do that with five other city council appointed boards. Uh, creative services, I, I mentioned before, Carla and Katie, um, they do everything from printing a small version of the municipal code that each police officer can carry in their pocket um, to getting all the envelopes taken care of for the court to send out summonses to every employee's business card. Um, you can't imagine all the things that our creative services team does. They do the big posters for um, zoning changes, um, zoning public hearings, or for uh, liquor license public hearings. We outsource about 70% of the job tickets that come in there. Um, some of the other things we do, we run the website Open Littleton, which is a two-way citizen engagement tool. The Visit Littleton website launched last June. Um, as a result of the approval of the lodger's tax, 
We have a budget now. Um, we told voters we would use a portion of the proceeds to market Littleton as a destination for um, visiting and tourism. We've hired an ad agency and we've hired a media buying company. Uh, we have a meeting with them Monday to see their plan, but we expect to kick that off April 1 with a big summer advertising campaign, and then we'll do another ad campaign uh, for the holiday season. Uh, uh, our department, me, also does the biannual citizen <coughs> survey. Um, we have just almost completed a three-year strategic communications plan. It's still in draft form. <coughs> I hope to be able to share that with the leadership team and with city council um, here coming up sometime this spring. Um, I talked about the Littleton Report, Littleton Report Online. We do the Littleton Calendar and Annual Report, and that includes uh, doing a photo contest with the members of the Fine Arts Committee. Uh, we print 8,000 copies of that. We have 12 sponsors of the calendar, and we distribute throughout the community um, through our buildings and through our sponsors. How much does the calendar cost? It's roughly $2 a copy, but we bring in half of that in sponsor revenue. So... Double $8,000. Um, we do a lot of video programming. Uh, you may have seen Around Town with Jim. Uh, we have a new issue that was just finished today. I heard today. that's award-winning. It, award it is the award-winning. Uh, the one that we're going to release tomorrow is an interview with the CEO of Littleton Hospital, Rick Dodds, talking about the new cardiology center. So it's a good you one. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, we're also working right now on videos for the state of the city. We're going to try a little bit different approach uh, with the state of the city. Instead of one video kind of highlighting all the things we've done, um, we're interviewing six or seven people um, to talk about exciting new projects that are coming up in Littleton. One of those is the hospital, uh, but there are some others. Um, we. Our staff was responsible for over 70 meetings last year that were live streamed and televised on Channel 8. Um, and as I think you're probably aware, the video recording of the meetings is the official minutes of the meetings. And so it's very important that um, we're able to do that well. Um, we have a new adaptive hearing um, system in the council chamber. That was something that Tyler researched and installed. You know, thank God for Tyler. And then Creative Services uh, did about over 340 um, job tickets in the last year. Uh, some of the things that I'm really proud of that were really strategic in the messaging that was created is uh, we worked on ballot questions 300 and 3K, um, especially on 3K, uh, the amount of time we had to communicate uh, what that was and uh, what the city was asking within the parameters of the Fair Campaign Practices Act. It was a very short time frame, but I was very happy that both of those were successful for the city. Um, we worked with a consultant to um, create the Big Things campaign to talk to the community about all the great infrastructure projects that are being done through the um, 3A money. I mentioned the strategic communications plan. Um, David is really <clears throat> very passionate about the work of the Tri-Cities. And if you haven't seen uh, what he did, he did a nine-part series called In Their Words, where he interviewed three or nine different um, people who have experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing, compelling series. And he's working, Tri-Cities now has like a communications team from each of the cities. So he's um, representing Littleton on that team. We manage all the QR codes for the city. Uh, anybody needs a QR code for a root and renew um, survey, uh, Kathy will create those uh, QR codes for it. We do a council recap meeting with the city manager uh, on the morning following a council meeting that's distributed internally to our employees. So Jim comes in and he just gives a recap of what council talked about the night before. It's a great way to let our employees know what council's doing. 
Um, <laughs> I think I would like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that in a negative way, but I, I walk out of the meetings and I'm just exhausted, so I would love to, love to see the recap. Well, I, yeah, I, 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 no, that would be fun. Yeah. I guarantee you his video is shorter than the meeting. <laughs> that, that's, oh, a, much from what I that's a low bar. <laughs> where, where is the uh, docudrama it's that Chief Stevens and I have pitched to your team? Be quiet Who was your love interest in the docudrama? <laughs> Um, I mentioned State of the City. We sell it out every year. Uh, we're capped at 150 because we don't have very many places. We don't have any places in Littleton that can handle a crowd larger than 150. We'll be doing that in the Bloom Room at Hudson Gardens this year. Um, the meet great needs are already scheduled at three different parks throughout the city. Uh, the board and commission dinner we're going to have at the Bloom Room at Hudson Gardens because Mother Nature finally beat me down. After last year's hailstorm, when we were cleaning up, I said, that's it. We're not having at the museum anymore. Um, so we got a BOGO at Hudson Gardens. Um, What's a BOGO? Buy one, get one. Buy one event, get the next one free. Oh, so, okay. um, and then I mentioned Visit Littleton Phase 3 is underway. Uh, talk about the criterium a little bit. You know, we have a verified count of 14,000 people that attended the Littleton Twilight Criterium last year. Um, in cooperation with community development, economic development, and IT, um, we have acquired Placer AI software, which is pretty amazing what it can do. Um, it, it can scrub out all the cell phones that are in the area on a daily basis or a regular basis because there are people who live there or work there, and it can count the number of new cell phones that move into the area. You had a great question on that, Pam, so thank you. Yeah, I didn't know things were that sophisticated. There, it, there's no personally Things are more sophisticated than that. <laughs> there's no personally identifiable information. Yeah, Just but, how many people. Well, what if you had your phone off, then it would pick you up. Right. So yeah, the way that where it, it tracks you know where your phone goes and it makes estimates on you know, well you keep going to this place every single night you must live in the census tract that's your estimated um, household income and you know it, it's it's very extrapolate Big Brother complex. I would say you shouldn't be surprised that your cell phone is being tracked all the time wherever you go and whatever you do. There's a reason every single ad you see on your place is served for a reason. Um, that event was, uh, we were very, very excited that it won best event last year um, through Downtown Colorado Inc. and the Governor's Award for Downtown <coughs> Excellence. Um, that was the 10th year of the Criterium. Uh, last year was also the 40th year of the Candlelight Walk. Um, we made it through that in spite of the fact that it was freezing cold out there. And, um, you know, the challenges that were presented because the trees were down, the lights were down, and um, we didn't have a very big budget to try to add some additional elements to the candlelight walk. Um, but we did add that drone show. And I don't know, did anybody see the drone show? Mm -hmm. It was so cool. So uh, we have asked them to come back uh, this year. And so I would say stay and see the drone show because you will be very, very impressed. Um, we did four Little Jam concerts last summer, and we're doing four again this summer. Um, Eagles, Queen, and... Choreo Speedway. Prince. Uh, we have three of those cover Tribute bands. Not, not the actual... <laughs> Definitely not Prince. <laughs> Prince is not coming Prince back to Prince is gone. Well. Yes. <laughs> so is Queen. Well, there's that too. Parts of I know they're, they're um, tribute bands uh, that we've hired. Um, and then we started... Last year, a group that meets from April to November that has representatives from all the city departments that are impacted by events such as police and public works and library and museum. And so we meet every month from April to November just to make sure we're on, on the same page. Bless you. Um, this slide just um, describes how our work fits within city council's priorities and outcomes and a few of the two to three year initiatives. I'd say you gotta have something on high quality governance for getting the word out of everything the city does. I think it's, uh, I think it should be in high quality govern governance, but I think that sort of fits within the one with vibrant community with a rich culture.
And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Wow, lots to do. So many things. I think you answered everyone's questions. Yay! Yeah. The department's just lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I, I have a great team. My employees, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to come to work, to work with my staff. They're very customer service driven. They are. And very talented. So thank you very much for your time. Steve is trying to get words out here. I was just going to ask real quick, you know, in terms of compared to your peers and other yeah. municipalities that are doing, you know, this kind of the level of event planning and whatnot, like how does our staffing compare? I mean, what you listed up here is a lot, um, and it's not just a handful of things, it's a wide diversity of kinds of things. Do oftentimes cities have, like for example, communications embedded in all the departments, and so their department communications department size is naturally lower, or how does, how does staffing compare? I think it's hard to compare apples to apples because we're all so different. Sure. Um, you know, we're, we're very different from Inglewood, and we're very different from um, our neighbors in Centennial, too. Um, so I, I feel like with the addition of the staff person that we're getting this year, I feel much better. We've been down that position since 2017, so from then to now, we've really been operating on a pretty thin margin. But I think getting this new person... Um, you know, there's people that applied for this position that blow my mind that um, there's some, you know, that you would recognize their names because there's a lot of people that have worked in the field of media, communications, journalism that want to come work in city government. It's not uncommon at all. David's not the first. So, um, you know, hard to make an apples to apples comparison, but I feel like we're in a good place right now. Do you, do you feel like with the lodger's tax... You know, obviously adding more juice to our arts and culture and events and, th and tourism and all that kind of stuff. Do you anticipate seeing an uptick in need for having more, again, more staff out there communicating all these wonderful events? Or do you feel like you've got it covered for the I'll most see, part for now? I think it's covered for now. But I, I think as more and more gets going with the Arts and Culture Commission and with the grants that are going out, um, we're, we're in the process of doing a video right now on some of the grant recipients. Um, you know, video is one of the things that I wish we could do more of because it really tells the story and people are very compelled to watch videos. But there's only one Tyler and so he can only do so much. But, um, you know, I think we'll be moving more towards making more videos. I have a question. Jim, one of just one kind of Stephen, question. I think what I've seen change even in the last couple of years, or I'd say evolve, is the kind of campaign or focused communications strategy needs that we've had. And some of those, uh, those expectations have, have really added, um, you know, challenges to the, uh, to the department. I think that's why that junior media strategist you know, who will have some, hopefully some video capacity to help in other areas. But when, when it comes to things like big things for the, the capital plan or, you know, the certainly the bicycle and pedestrian safety initiative that we're embarking <coughs> on now, um, there's been some really heavy asks. And I'm sure I'm, I'm, I just listed two of probably a half dozen in my time here where we've asked our the communications department to be you know, much more uh, strategic and thoughtful and concentrated in that uh, communication. So I think, you know, communications has really established themselves with these ongoing tools that really that, that communicate what the city's doing so well, like the Littleton uh, report and so much of the social media that we do. But the, the evolution has been to keep that going while also kind of layering on these more strategic efforts that we really need to advance understanding and, you know, places that the council wants to take the community. And this three-year comms plan identifies some things that I think, whoa, I mean, how like, are we going to get that done? So it, It's more out of excitement than anything that we would 
you know, seek to put more resources to things like multimodal transportation outreach strategies or ballot initiatives or, you know, public works projects. I mean, there's just a lot of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, thank you. And I just want to say too, the Tri-Cities Homelessness video series that y'all and David, David put together like, it was really, really moving. So I thank you. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Andrew. How, how do you think our <coughs> interaction with like the social media and the Visit Littleton website, do we have any way of knowing how that compares to other cities? Um, or like of our size? Well, part of what we're going to be doing with our two contractors, we'll be able to get a lot of measurements. Um, they have a lot of key performance indicators. Right now, that Visit Littleton website, with no promotion at all, um, had, has about 1,400 visitors a month. Um, the most visited was the Candlelight Walk in November. That was the most visited page. Um, but, you know, we're slowly starting to drive people to the Visit Littleton site through our own platforms. But once this campaign starts, I really expect it to amp up a lot because it's got hotels on it. You can, there's a direct link to all the hotels, to the restaurants. Um, we are, <clears throat> including many of our partners in the community, you know, I met with Rock's Gallery this morning, Littleton Symphony. Um, you know, anybody that does anything in the tourism realm that's in the city, we want to have them featured there. So I think this time next year, we would have a lot more information for you. And how do we, how do you decide what goes on any of those things? Because this, like, Visit Littleton looks like Breckenridge Brewery paid for them, like, on here three times. There's only, like, five restaurants. How do we... Is that going to be fattened up with that whole initiative? Well, we've been working in partnership with Economic Development to try to make sure that we have all the restaurants in the city listed there. And then we also work with Economic Development to try to get any of the businesses that are tourism related. We're not going to put an insurance agency on there or a doctor's office, but anything in the tourism universe um, would be eligible to be on there. And then same with the like social media. Is it open to like what? Littleton Social Cycle is doing, or what, playing at Town Hall, or? Uh, what? Well, that gets a little trickier. <clears throat> um, the city attorney would, could probably speak better to what creates a public forum. So our, in the Littleton Report, and in all of our social media, and Littleton Report Online, it's city programs and services, because that's our priority, and those of our agency partners. So anyone we have um, <clears throat> an arrangement with, like if we give you a grant, then we have a relationship with you. Or if it's for Denver Regional Council of Governments is doing bike to work, we'll do that because we have a relationship with Dr. Cog. So there has to be some sort of established relationship. Otherwise, we would have to open up our platforms to everybody in the community, and then we couldn't possibly do that. I'm not going to promote like a realtor doing horseback carriages in their neighborhood or anything. <laughs> That's what I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, exci I'm excited about yeah. your intern uh, creating your TikTok channel, so I look forward to seeing that. I don't know about TikTok. I'm not there yet. I'm there. It's oh, good. It's, it's your future. <laughs> Libraries are doing great on TikTok. Are you going to dance I do on see it? all the restaurants on TikTok. Yeah, as, far as, as far as you know, I have danced on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Go look you up. It's my, not on my account. <laughs> Any other questions? You ask your daughters. That's where you'd find it. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thank, Thank you. Kelly. Great work. Thank really so appreciate much, it. Kelly. Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's bring up the economic I, development. I know this might surprise you, Gretchen. I ain't got no rhythm. <laughs> Just do the Carlton? Pretty much, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> anything more. That actually was more rhythm than I got. What? So who could ask for anything more? Sorry, music man. Show tunes. Jesus. Oh, music no, man's coming up. Are you going to uh, heritage? My... All right, so uh, last up on the agenda tonight is the uh, number 38 uh, economic partnership agreement. We've talked about this generically before, but... We'll talk a little more detail here. Thanks, Mayor. Yes. So on January 8th, Council had study sessions on both our economic retail environment and, you know, ways that we can be uh, competitive and then also had a, a, a discussion on our current economic incentive, economic partnership policy that we have for helping to incentivize and um, you know, make some of these, make Littleton attractive to 
um, retailers, restaurants in, in certain uh, circumstances. So uh, we told you then that we had some of these that were interested in com coming forward soon. Excuse me, I need some water. Um, but, and, and tonight is really the first one of those since, since January. So I just want to make a couple of points that I think are, are really important to uh, underscore. Um, we took notes, we kind of uh, compared that with, from, we took notes at the January 8th session on the incentive criteria. We also then squared the proposal and the work that we were, were doing at that time with number 38 with uh, the notes from that session and also the, the existing policy that we have. And there was a lot, mostly overlap between those two. Um, we feel that, that this Re, that this request does meet those criteria. Um, important because I, I know sometimes incentives can be uh, can be misunderstood and there's a, a wide range of how different municipalities do this. But in a little tin, you know, we do not front money. It's, it's re real important that I think the public knows and certainly council is clear that we would never uh, uh, recommend an incentive that fronted city money or in any way put existing city revenues at risk. Um, the, the incentive recommendation that you uh, have tonight relies you know, solely on the uh, restaurant, in this case, uh, generating that revenue that then would help them to make the project overall work here in a Littleton. So um, that's an important point to, to keep in in mind, um, the others, you know, th those criteria, which I, I know Cindy and Andrew will um, will emphasize, but just the idea that we have to cover costs for basic services first, and uh, that we then will will we'll consider sharing back some revenue if there is the uh, policy basis and the uh, if it does meet you know policy goals like this one does. So with that. I'll turn it over to Cindy, and Cindy can kind of lead us off and introduce our, our consultant partner, and uh, we'll give an, an overview of this. Our, our purpose tonight, we aren't asking for your approval of an agreement, but especially since this is our first one, we wanted you to you know, have uh, some discussion like this and ask any questions that you might have. Um, and then if you're, if you, we do have, have a direction tonight to come back to you with an agreement, we'll be doing that with, within your next couple of meetings because I, I know that uh, number 38 is eager to kind of hear where the city stands on this so that they can make their decisions about, about moving forward here. With, with that, I'll turn it over to Cindy. Good evening. Um, thank you for the overview. You all know me, Cindy Perry. You also knew Andrew Knudsen from EPS, um, our consultant that we engaged um, on this particular assignment. Um, I think Jim covered the purpose of our, our meeting tonight really well. Um, we received a request from an applicant for an incentive. Um, I will say the applicant is here this evening um, in the audience um, observing. Um, the project is uh, about an 8,500 square foot um, restaurant and a bar with um, some interior entertainment. Um, it is a quality design, catalytic, popular um, concept. Um, and it is a small business and those are the types of users that we're really um, working to attract. Cindy, um, I meant to ask the question in my email of questions. 8,500, is that the total fo uh, footprint of the entire building or just the floor of the restaurant itself where patrons are seated? Does that include the, the kitchen and everything? or That is the entire building the entire that you're building. verifying, correct? Yes. yes. It would be the outside space. And, and the, the patio. Yeah. Right. Well, pretty big. And that includes outside space, right? Yes. It does include the patio. Um, and this is going, proposed for Littleton Village, which I think we all know has been underdeveloped. Um, it's been difficult to attract um, quality tenants to that site. Um, the, the restaurant is called Number 38. You may have heard of them in the Rhino location. You know, I just want to point out that this concept is more suburban in nature. Um, there is an outdoor patio, but there's not entertainment necessarily outside. 
Um, I also want to highlight that um, you know there's been a lot of press surrounding some of um, alleged noise issues at the Rhino location, and there has never been a single citation um, associated with that use. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, and the difference again with the music is that it's, it's planned to be indoor here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, if you've been to the Rhino location, I mean, it's 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 an outdoor entertainment area, so very different concept than than what we have here. Um, so this isn't the first time uh, we've been before you. This slide simply highlights some of our our prior conversations. Um, where I think the theme that, that came out of most of those conversations was that economic incentives are an important tool to catalyze um, development that we would like to see here. Um, I will very briefly go over the analysis. This is where Andrew's team kind of came into play and we'll open that up to Q&A when when the presentation is done. Um, but th they did a, a deeper dive into projections and, and kind of did an independent review of the request. I think some key points are that this particular proposal includes um, a baseline sales tax payment. And, and that's somewhat unique for an incentive agreement like this. Um, the baseline sales tax proposed in this um, Incentive is $30,000 per year, and that more than covers any city costs for services, and that will go throughout the term of the agreement. Um, so even with the rebate, this project has a positive net fiscal impact each year. So those are just some highlights of the analysis findings. Um, and as Jim mentioned, um, you know, we heard a lot of the feedback at our last study session, um, and this particular proposal meets a number of existing policy criteria. I, I do want to note that we'll be, bring, be bringing back um, an updated incentive policy, um, and, but this one was um, evaluated based on our current policy and feedback from council at the last study session. Um, so, Cindy, is there a minimum threshold of tax or revenue that you look at in addition to these kinds of things? It, it's an, it depends question. It depends on the proposal. It de depends on the type of project. Um, our current policy doesn't identify that threshold. I mean, that's, you know, it, it, it um, you know, we look for it to cover cost of service, and that's what we did here. And I would say that that's not always the most important. It's, it's, it's not a, you know, very high criteria sometimes, especially like this one where they're really, we are, um, you know, we would take this action in order to, to catalyze develop in an area that's been very hard to develop. Um, Littleton Village, as we all know, with the, uh, with the, the metro district in place, um, is a has been challenging for retail. So in some cases, if there's a high quality project like this, you know, it may make sense to the, the council um, to incentivize development, which we're, you know, if, if there's a thought that that could catalyze other development that might not be, be subject to such, you know, sharing agreements. So would it be appropriate to say, given the policy, that it's kind of a case by case basis? Mm -hmm. Based, based on, on the, the mix this stuff, of but here, factors. like we know, Littleton Village underdeveloped. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this particular proposal um, is quality. So quality begets quality. You know, so if we if we can catalyze quality investment in Littleton, um, it makes this kind of interesting. You know, it, people are gonna it's gonna pique um, other investors and. and um, developers of these types of uses that we want to attract here. So um, that is one of the criteria within the policy. Um, again, the underdeveloped piece of land, this adds a unique tenant. This is a small, it's a small business, um, locally based. They promote um, local beverages and um, uh, um, food services. So, you know, really, really locally driven. 
um, again, positive revenue to the city. But you did say we're going to revisit that policy going forward. We are bringing we are bringing something back yeah, that I, is I, yeah, I, a little more updated. Yeah, I would I would um, like the new policy to have let me have a more thoughtful discussion around when we do and don't give. Um, because at this point, it's not clear to me uh, how many places wouldn't qualify. I mean, it feels like it's a, the door is pretty wide open. And that may be OK, but I think I would like us to have that conversation. Um, but, I, I, but, but that's not a comment about this current proposal. Yeah. Um, so the deal points um, that, that we're proposing are, it works out basically to a 50% tax rebate. Again, not an upfront um, contribution. Uh, the rebate is on annual sales tax generated over that $30,000 baseline. Um, again, that $30,000 base exceeds city costs for services, so it's more than covering um, services for that type of use. Uh, we'll get 100% of use and property tax. The max rebate is $400,000, and our term is five years. So um, it will expire either with the maximum rebate issue. So if they're killing it in year three and they're, they hit that $400,000 or $400,000 max, we're done. Um, or it will go to five years. Um, whichever occurs first. Uh, can I review this for a second? Yes. So is it thirty thousand dollars per year or thirty thousand over year. the five per years? Year. Each year it starts over the clock again. Okay. So it's thirty thousand per year. So no matter what, we're going to make um, one hundred fifty thousand over the first five years, right? Andrew, is that correct? Thirty times fifty. So, uh, assuming, assuming they don't, they're staying in business, right? Correct. And so the thirty grand, that's the first. Tranche, right, right, and that comes to the city. Right, we we're guaranteed yes. if they stay in business, yes. Yes. and we're we're. I mean, obviously, if they go out of business, that's all. But we're guaranteed one hundred fifty thousand. I believe your uh, analysis last time was like the the city services cost is like seven thousand dollars per year. So we're over five years. We're going to spend not counting the permitting of the new business, which is a different thing, but. Not counting the permitting, we're gonna we're gonna spend twenty one thousand dollars. Oh wait, over five years. Sorry, thirty five thousand dollars. I can do math. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And we're gonna receive one hundred fifty thousand minimum. Minimum. And so that there's no other. If the if they stay in the risk to us is if they don't stay in business. But that's the risk of any new business in town, right? There's no true, and you might say that there's no risk because if they don't. Uh, remain in business, there's no additional... Right, there's no cost to us, we're right. just disappointed. Right. It's our yes. disappointment exactly. of, a, of a shuttered business and the ugliness right. of a shuttered business. Okay, True. and then um, and then the, the limits to our kind of payout is, so for them to get $400,000, they need to bring in over, let's say $400,000 over five years, they need to bring in uh, dollars exactly. exactly. And so if they get $400,000 out of us, we will have received $550,000 exactly. in tax revenue and been out $35,000 in services. So the, this, there's no risk to the city on this. We're not fronting any money. We're not taking a loan. We're not... Um, for what what we're doing is sharing the revenue they're raising for us in a place where there's no revenue being raised right now, and it's a place that's what is it when you say Jim that it's a hard place to develop? What does that mean that Littleton Village is a hard place to develop? Or maybe Cindy? I don't, I, yeah, there's not a lot of people knocking on the door to. Why, but why is that? One of the factors is that the metro district in place covers the residential and commercial properties, and they have very different effects on those different uses. And um, Metro District of, of you know, 50 extra mills paid in property tax for a commercial business is a significant you know, hurdle um, when they're trying to make a project pencil. I know that Cindy might speak, I don't know, Cindy or Andrew might speak to 
you know, any other statements that um, the applicant has made just, just about, you know, the nature of the financing for the project um, is, is challenging and having this in place will give additional, you know, confidence we had, there. You know, we had done a, a study where we had hired a consultant uh, several years ago to look at a, a previous potential incentive agreement at that specific location, maybe not that location, but in that area. And I think some of the findings were just upon, uh, well, Cindy, I mean, it's probably fresh. Starboard Realty Study. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Andrew actually had a recent conversation with them, but but the gist of it is, is really twofold. You know, the Metro District um, creates unique challenges there for financing and penciling a project, plus just the current economic condition in today's market is, is making um, financing projects like this more and more challenging. So, you know, that results in kind of a double whammy gap um, to to complete a, a quality project. So I don't know if you have anything on this, Starboard. So uh, uh, interest to standard for master plan communities is to create metro districts uh, that are tailored for residential uses and commercial uses and keep them distinct because Gallagher, I don't know when it was adopted, but decades oh, ago. May it rest in peace. Yeah, <laughs> has over the years created a four to one differential between residential and commercial. And in Littleton Village, it, uh, the districts were structured such that all the, the mills are uniform across residential and commercial. Thus, the commercial really bears a burden that in many other places, industry standard, you just alleviate that burden by creating different districts and doing a lower mill, mill rate on the commercial to accommodate for the differential and, in assessment. And ratio. likewise, residents really uh a burden when there's no commercial when there's supposed to be commercial there so there's it's and you remember have you guys been fully briefed on littleton village you know it's like context and background and no i i asked jim to give me a briefing when that we would be met last good. week and so i feel like i'm halfway caught up but i'm happy to learn more. there's a lot there that i think you both would benefit from that i think you should know before you consider anything with respect to this i think it would be helpful so you were going to answer Thank my you. question if this deal happens and that now we have some uh, more uh, commercial tax, will it help alleviate some of the debt? And so it will help the residents. From, any any uh, sorts of mills being paid to the Metro District is gonna help. Right now there's nothing. <laughs> yeah. So it will lower probably the increase in tax, uh, the property tax for the uh, yeah. residents. Probably yeah. slow the rate of increase. For, uh, okay, I just wanted yes. to make sure. Yes, it's right true. Now, it does benefit. Almost all of the of the liability for the metro district is on the, the residential users. Right. As as we can develop that that commercial there, that liability will be shared between residential and commercial, which effectively reduces the liability on the uh, residential use. And do how do we make sure that that happens the way it's supposed to? Uh, it's guaranteed. The new bonds were refunded 10 weeks ago, or restructured very recently. And it's uh, investment grade financing at this point. And the structure of the debt guarantees that additional AV reduces the mill levy. So it's lives. kind of automatic and there's no board to make changes that might not be appropriate. That's correct. Okay. And in this case, because it's an investment grade bond restructuring, that provision is guaranteed on this project. That's not necessarily, different metro districts, particularly if they're dirt or greenfield, uh, will assume that additional AV, that's anticipated and that doesn't reduce mill rate. That just builds out absorption according to the forecasts. In this case, uh, every AV reduces, every additional square foot of assessed valuation reduces the mill. Okay. Thank you. And so, oh, Has the metro district been approached? Um, they don't need to be well, asked. they're part of the approval process um, with planning. So yes. So yes, I mean not, not yet. the incentive because they're, they don't play into the incentive. What about all. the restaurant itself? But the actual development, they're part of that approval process. Yeah. I just wanted to um, rebut something you said. I agree with you 100 percent, 
Um, but an opposing view would be what the city would be out is, you know, in your scenario of the $950,000, the city's making five fifty dollars and not out anything. Um, it, without an incentive and having a, a business come in without an incentive, the, I guess the opposing view would say, well, the city would get everything then rather than only part of it. However, I agree with what you say. We don't have a whole lot of people saying we want to build here. If, if it was... If there was a lot of demand to build there, and we are looking at this, I don't think there would necessarily be an incentive. But I think that's this incentive because it's it's struggled to get someone to go there, and that's what we're getting to. So, yeah. I mean, some sales tax revenue is better than none, which is our current situation. Yeah, and and if this turns into a property that's raising, I mean, the four hundred thousand dollar, the 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 max rebate is based. We already said it's based on a hundred and. Twenty thousand dollars a year. If I'm reading, if I remember, for five years, right? Uh, max rebate is uh, four hundred thousand dollars over. Right, five years. but the revenue, if we were paying out four hundred thousand dollars over five years, we're make the total tax revenue raised is five fifty. Five five. five right, but I mean per year. The, and out years, it's going to continue bringing in oh, over yeah, hundred. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. More. It'll be that so it, 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 it the over over the lifetime of this property, if it stays um, open for twenty years, we're we're going to make oh yeah a lot of absolutely a lot about two hundred thousand dollars a year. And and, and I, I want to be clear, like making a lot of money is all about how we invest in the parks we talked about earlier today. And we invest in bikeways, and it's not just that, it's not gonna to come to my paycheck. It's about how we create money to invest in the city, so. It's also about adding an amenity that we just do not have. Right. Which and is important. There, beyond, the, beyond the monetary benefit of it, it's the fact that like there's also, it's also adding a facet to the things we offer as a city that we just, also don't offer. Yeah. You like, don't even think about sales tax. The residents of Lipson Village have been clamoring for a restaurant to go to. That in itself is important. Well, I like it's kind of on the corner of our city. We're going to make all the people drive on Centennial Roads to come to our <laughs> amenity. So. You'll, you'll get some info from Highlands Ranch, too. Yeah, exactly. Although Broadway, do we pay for that? I don't know. We police it. All right, all right continue. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so fiscal impact, if we move forward with this, as, as Jim mentioned, there's, really, there's no negative impact to general fund. The rebate's only realized if the, I think that's a typo, if the applicant performs. Um, uh, we've talked about the estimated sales tax revenues, positive net fiscal impact, um, ROI is positive. Um, so all, all good points. So our, our recommendation is um, that, you know, staff uh, recommend support of the request. And with that, we will open it up for further discussion. Anyone else have any other questions? So what is zoned? So the, 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 the I actually have a pet peeve around noise, so I don't like noise. And But this property is literally facing a street with a business park on the other side so that if the noise is coming out of the front it's not going into a residential neighborhood but what's going to what is zoned to be behind it that's the amley properties to, yes. to the east of it when you that's right thank it. you that's what i meant yeah. to the east, east of it. Be, it'll be a multi-family and then on the south side of that amley multi-family is commercial more commercial um, amley's proposing ground floor commercial as well so it's mixed use. So it's right between the Starbucks and the Culver's. Is that where it's supposed mm -hmm. to go? Right there on Broadway? On Broadway. Oh, I was thinking it was on the corner. Oh, it's okay. on the corner. So, so it's in between Culver's and Starbucks, correct? Correct. Okay. And then the patio side, is that facing south or facing to the west? I am directionally challenged. Face it faces Broadway. Can you imagine building sure. that? It's up, down, left, right. Right, right. right. I just want to know. Because there's people who've done that. Like, there's yeah, yeah. idiots who face away from the mountain. Right. So, where concerns tr us trying to come up with, I think, Robert, to what, your point earlier about guidelines and boundaries around uh, essentially what is the need on behalf of the applicant. 
and how are we appropriately matching that need with incentive packages? Um, you know, what can you kind of walk me through the financial analysis to say like how does this percentage, this floor base rate of sales tax collection on behalf of the city, how does this specific package make it so that it pencils out and if it were not to occur, how it doesn't pencil out? See, this is the hard thing for us is because we don't have that kind of third party optic as to like what are those break even points for their numbers and revenue generation, especially in the first few years. So yeah, I'll let Andrew talk about kind of the financial piece, but I'll, I'd like to also take an opportunity to remind um, council that um, there's a financial piece and then there's um, the incentive, you know, so are we, are we attracting that unique use? Are we helping um, incentivize development on an underutilized parcel or development area? So there's, there's really a broad range of consideration in addition to the, to the financial piece oh, of that. And I would just also acknowledge owners sitting in the audience here. I know can't participate, you know, tonight in this meeting, but maybe at the, when it, it, you know, if it gets to that point, which I assume it will, to come back to council for approval to speak at, at, at that point to council during presentation. That makes sense. Yeah, we'll be able to hear you know, a little bit more directly from the, the applicant then. Yeah. Um, well, so and I would say, Cindy, I feel like at our last meeting, I said one of my priorities was local because I think that's part of the charm of a small city. And I, I've heard you say several times this is local, and I, I really appreciate fact that you kind of uh, said that, so thank you. I might uh, add that in addition to Cindy's points about the unique uh, <laughs> nature of this and uh, the fact that it is underdeveloped, I mean we do, the, I guess the two things I would add is that we do have a barrier. Uh, we've had, we have entitled land in a very strong market that sat vacant for years. Yep. And that barrier really is the uh, uh, the triple nets, so that's everything, uh, that's the taxes, among other other things. But uh, that's, as anyone's running their pro forma, once they calculate that in, it's a hurdle that's very hard to clear. So that's part of the justification. The other uh, part that many councils uh, look at is catalytic effect. And if you can attract capital in this location and get those trips coming in, the idea is that, uh, especially with the mixed use, because mixed use is, a great idea, it is challenging to fill that first floor with retail tenants that are really vibrant. To our point, you know, I think you had some very tough questions the last time about how that works. And so, you know, we, we did a study throughout the Rocky Mountain West trying to identify the most effective town centers and the nature of the most effective town centers. And by far, it's the ones with restaurants um, that are easy to walk to and cycle to and uh, on a small scale. And those are vibrant, and that will hopefully have this catalytic effect throughout the rest of Littleton Village, and that's worth every penny you can, you know, within reason. So it'll attract right. more businesses, hopefully. Exactly. That's the goal. Yeah, Cindy, I like this. I appreciate it. We talked barely six weeks ago about doing this, and you put something together, uh, very creative, and it meets some of those criteria that we discussed. Um, I certainly want to hear from you know everyone who might be impacted. But I think it's great. I think this is something that we need for that area. And I like what you were saying. And it fits within what we're trying to do. And there is an opportunity cost, of course, but it's an opportunity cost of potential versus actual. And potential has been how long has it been vacant? So can I ask if well, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, at, looking towards the incentives, how do we know that we're not even, how do we know if we're aiming too low in terms of an incentive package? This is kind of coming back to the right sizing of what it is. I mean, we don't want the business, obviously, struggling mightily to break even in the first, you know, especially in the first few years. And, you know, in terms of getting this right, 50% is... Nice round number, it is half, but that's not necessarily like scientifically driven, so. This isn't also just the first throw out of what staff's doing. This is a compromise going back and forth. Over okay. Some, some negotiation here, right? Yeah, was, we've, yeah, we've been talking with the applicant um, through the process, and it, it does vary. I mean, it 
It, it depends on you know what their pro forma may look like, and that's that's where Andrew's team comes in to play. You know, really vetting those pro formas against you know the market and industry and all the things. Um, I mean. I don't like to say percentage because it's really, you know, what are we getting in return? But, you know, you, there may be a situation where, you know, they have higher startup costs in year one or two. So it's, it, again, it's a case by case basis. It just so happened that in this case, that's how it landed. But we've been working with Andrew and the applicant to, to combat those, those needs. It's some of what City and her team have been talking about is how do we collectively be good stewards of billions of dollars? And um, so we don't want to give too much uh, in that sure. goal. And if for any reason it's not enough, not I think enough. around month seven, month eight, month nine, uh, we may be <laughs> we may be getting a knock on the door, and then we'll know. Right. Uh, but better to go in uh, on the conservative side and then let that conversation unfold as needed. And if it's not enough to start with, the applicants probably say, "Yeah, that's not enough. I can't. I'm not going to work on that." So well, I was going to say too, because fifty percent, you know per year over five years is different than also 50% on and average over a five-year period, too. So and we're not, you can't think of 50%. That's It's $400,000 or yeah. five years. And so it's not, I mean, it, you can't really think of it as 50%. It's, that's just a way to get to those years. So it's a $400,000 deal. It's a $400,000 deal, yeah. But depending on when you collect it and how you collect it also makes a big difference. You know, for example, if you are collecting a majority of that, Evenly through, or if you're collecting that evenly throughout five years versus if it less tails, on if it the tails front. off, yeah, yeah. but yeah, they can do it all in year one, yeah, which would be good for everyone, which sure. would be wonderful. <laughs> Just confirming that the package perfect. is leaving enough leeway essentially for the business to be successful moving in and wouldn't want that to be essentially due to us so that it would not. That's, I was going to ask Cindy if she knew, and uh, the other two recent ones were. King Supers and Breck Ridge. Do you know what those, the, the big the number dollars were? Is, the dollars uh, were. Breck was, I was not here, 250. So um, and I think Reed's also looking at Reed up. probably has more rec clear recollection. Uh, no, <laughs> well, then. <laughs> um, so Breckenridge was 212, sorry, $212,500. It was a similar situation in terms of there was a baseline in terms of uh, the first $40,000 Breckenridge would get to keep anything over that there would be the 50% split okay, it was over a period of five years. Um, King Supers, and that was done in 2014. King Supers, which preceded that in 2013. Um, Tiffany's back there. Why are we asking Tiffany? She's smarter than she's, she's waiting. Because I'm trying to remember myself. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's hiding. Good. But I, th I thought it was four. Um, four. I think for King Supers, if I remember correctly, the total was about $500,000, and it was a five-year deal, but uh, time elapsed before they get there. Balance. Yeah, so. King Supers was 500000 There wasn't a, a share back, per se. They were allowed to keep 100%. Um, for the first six years. So, yeah, so this is, I mean, in line with some of the other things there. It's not like it's too low or, or too high. That's why I'm getting at. I had one one question. I sent the email. The I was looking at projection, you know, six to year six through seven, and the discrepancy between table six and table, I want to say it was 13 and 14. Um, looking, it was the percent of why the sales tax was expected to basically skyrocket from years six to ten. I know the answer was because there's no um, the rebate, but that's I don't buy it because the rebate's accounted for in table thirteen. There, um, the sales tax was uh, you know one ten to one uh, one forty in there, um, and it looks like it takes off two thirty. I can see that two three percent increase, and it goes from two thirty three four. Five, six and a half. I don't know why. Also, it's exponential. Year six to seven. So I think all the all the other numbers in this look good. That was just the one thing like that stood out. Like there's something not being told with that. And you're talking about the paragraph on the bottom of page. No, the table thirteen. The, table thirteen and fourteen. And so uh, table thirteen is basically. You see a, Oh yeah. Yeah. 
It's only 8.30, so you haven't hit your 9 o'clock, would you know yet? I think it's because there's going to be a new mayor and the governor. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> so I was just wondering, you know, that just seems... We should verify Highly that unlikely means. or highly optimistic or something, because I don't know why. Those years, we would have a, a, a almost tripling of sales tax, but the first five years, it's the normal 2% increase. So, you know, it's important to base these things off of numbers and, you know, let's... Andrew, if you need to check, we yeah. should... Thank we, you. We will have to uh, call that out when we, we come back to council for the, the next... Thank you for the question, and we will double check that. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? Steve? I'm super excited about it, honestly. I just want them in. Yeah. I, I think I think it's, you know, I'm getting the sense, I hope you consensus the council think this is, is good. This is kind of something that we've needed there for a long time. We're glad that we have someone that is interested, but not only interested, that actually excites the community. I've gotten calls from community members saying, that's going to be an awesome uh, addition to um, Littleton Village, but Littleton and the, the broader region, too. So I think we should be excited about this and hope they're successful, because if they're successful, we're successful, and our residents are successful. So. And I'm excited, too. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Okay. All right. Um, any report update for the city manager? I'll just um, mention that um, for the public, Thank there you. is a, the, uh, the, the City Council and our Transportation Mobility Board will be meeting on Thursday morning for a, a breakfast meeting with the RTD senior leadership. So we're the executive director, the chief of police, and uh, several of their board members uh, will be able to have conversations about service levels in Little Tenant at our stations. and. You know, make sure that we, we that our issues are on their their radar, and um, I'd like to add anything there, Mayor. But it's an important opportunity, and that meeting will be open for uh, observation to uh, oh, public too. So. I know Robert said he's going to be out of town, not be able to be there. But is anybody else going to be able to make it? Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Guy. It's here. It's fine. It's here. It'll be here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we have breakfast. Thank you. Yes. It'll be breakfast. Yeah. So, um, and you know. City manager and I had a, I don't want to say a preview, but when we had our city managers and mayors meeting at Greenwood Village eight weeks ago, something like that, they, the, it was RTD's um, police give their update. And so I'm, we'll probably get um, something similar here, but I think a little bit broader, especially now that we're in the first part of the general assembly session here. And I know there's some talk about some, change, um, some legislation, but also it's a good time for us to talk to them about, you know, what are our priorities? We, you know, what are we seeing with our TV? We hear from our, our residents and things like that, so. When I was at the meeting, CML, people were not excited about the change in board. They'd like the representative board rather than the city attorney, any? No, just to, to follow up to that, I'll, I'll be sending out uh, an email shortly to the city council just updating you all on some of those transportation uh, issues that are that are currently being floated around. One of those being um, that potential change from the fifteen elected board members to six appointed, one one elected. Um, the, you know that's not really anything new. I would say that that effort actually shows up every few years where they try to advance something, changing that you know how that board is is composed. So. Um, but I think it might have a little bit more steam, no pun intended. So that's it. And then just for council, I'll have, we'll get to have Colin get you the tables for the boards and commissions. So I'll, I'll try to make sure you know who to call, which board and everything with their phone number. The two little tweaks that I, I think I talked to everyone about that that came up after, after the fact. But uh, hopefully we can get, start doing that this week and get that out there. So. Thank you. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you.